What up, meatheads? It's Travis, American Butcher. And this, well, you know what it is, my friends. It is the Meat Block Podcast, the weekly podcast by butchers for everyone. And this week's episode, we're going to be talking about bandsaws. Yes, bandsaws. Some of you want to be artisanal as F and use hand saws and you know, brag about not using band saws. And I see all these things where it's like, you know, split by hand and hand saw or whatever hashtags of people using this skill as a way to put down other butchers who use band saws because they obviously believe in neolyticism, just like their hero, Ted Kaczynski. I'm just joking. But seriously, this this I the example I use all the time is this is let's say I have a shovel in a tractor and I need to move a yard of dirt. I could get the same exact results with both. So why would I use the shovel? Is it because I appreciate the shovel? Is it because the shovel brings me back to the roots and the artisanism of of the craft of moving dirt? So I could really feel like I got my day's work in? Or would I use the backhoe and then do some other shit? Now, granted, a lot of people who do cut by hand are doing small numbers. And, it, you know... When I break carcasses for friends and family at my house or uh, at their house, say, like, if I do, like, three lambs, I have a meat bandsaw, and three lambs is not worth me getting a bandsaw dirty. If I'm breaking half a beef for someone, and I am also the cleaner, uh, getting a handsaw or getting a bandsaw dirty wouldn't make sense in that situation either. Knowing that I would go over a cut sheet and gear it to make, make it easier as far as boneless cuts and things like that and steer it in a direction where they didn't even know it was being steered because I had the gift of gab and I could just suggest things ever so slightly in the whispers of the winds and make it think it was their idea. All that being said, this episode is about bandsaws and we're going to be talking about techniques uh, skill set you know safety so please enjoy good cutting enhances the quality of good meat poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat regardless of quality Ryan O'Hearn here, and this episode is all about bandsaws. I'm going to try to be fairly thorough, so there's going to be multiple parts to this episode. Multiple sections. Uh, section one will really be about safety, to start off with safety, because if you're not safe and you don't use the right etiquette and you use the right habits with the bandsaw, then you won't have a very long career with the bandsaw and you won't get to the higher levels of intermediate and advanced uh, techniques. So you got to start off with safety. So the first se section will be safety and foundational habits. Next, we'll get into some basic concepts, techniques, and stances that are common and are useful. Next, we'll get into some particular beginner's advice, um, chining basics, and close cuts. So I got some beginner advice for chining and close cuts. We'll talk briefly about sawing knuckle bones. I'll offer some general tips for being more effective in your work. Those would be more like uh, um, intermediate to advanced tips. There'll be uh, next. There'll be a general maintenance and longevity section to to the maintenance and longevity of your particular bandsaw. 
And lastly, there'll be a little bonus section entitled Common Methods for Dropping the Chuck Primal Four Quarter from the Rail onto the Bandsaw. So that'll be the bonus section. All right. Firstly, let me remind everyone that a bandsaw is one of a variety of possible butcher tools. All the tools are good, whether it be a cleaver, knife, um, handsaw, uh, hairnet, uh, or bandsaw. They're all good. No one tool is superior necessarily. Each tool is effective in its own way, and each tool is and can be situationally appropriate, can be the best fit for situation. Now, in production meat cutting, which is high-volume meat cutting, bandsaws are very, very useful. There are a few things you can do with each tool that you cannot do with the other tools. Um, A bandsaw, when it comes to a bandsaw, Clearly, a bandsaw helps you move through more material quickly. Um, And then there's a few things that you can do with a bandsaw that you either can't do with other tools or would be a little bit too labor-intensive, such as sawing up marrow bones and knuckle bones quickly is really fairly pretty easy on a bandsaw, and it can be labor-intensive with a handsaw. Um, Canoe-shaped marrow bones are are tricky with any other tool. Um, thin cut Korean style or flanking style beef short ribs is easy to accomplish on a bandsaw. Uh, partial chine. Sometimes you need to do not a full chine on certain uh, loins, but you want to do a partial chine for aesthetic, and that's easy to accomplish on a bandsaw. Uh, in the case of partially chining seven bone roast, some people like to do that in case of partially chining Um, pork loin roasts or um, lamb loin you can do that with a bandsaw it's easy to nip off a little bit of the chine in the bandsaw Um, across my career I have used only models of Hobart brand bandsaws and Butcher Boy brand bandsaws in general I prefer at this point I prefer bandsaws that have a wider and larger surface area on the tabletop. Briefly now, I will mention some of the label names for the different various parts of the bandsaw. I need to put some label names on several parts of this of the bandsaw so that I can talk about them more effectively and you guys will know what I'm talking about. Um, there's the frame of the bandsaw. Every th- all the moving parts, removable parts, are taken off the bandsaw. You're left with a frame. On that frame, we put two band wheels, um, and we put a, a flexible blade, circular cutting blade. So I'll call that the flexible blade or the blade. The cutting blade of the bandsaw go- fits over the two band wheels. Um, and then we have the tabletop of the bandsaw there is a stationary platform portion of the tabletop and there is a sliding platform portion of the tabletop the sliding platform is the portion of the bandsaw that your that comes in contact with your hips when you're standing to the side of the bandsaw and you're using your hips to slide the platform that's the sliding platform now there's two primary guards on the bandsaw that I'll refer to many times. Um, There is the vertical saw blade guard, which covers the blade. And you slide this vertical saw blade guard up and down to a higher position and a lower position. And then finally, there is the adjustable measuring guard or the adjustable measuring portioning guard, which slides and is adjustable in a perpendicular direction to the saw blade, the cutting blade. You move it into, let's say, one inch to cut stakes at one inch. You move it out to two inches to cut stakes at two inches, etc. There's a measuring component, and there is a, 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 it's, it's a measuring or portioning guard. Okay. 
All right, part one. Part one is about basic safety etiquette and habits. Safety etiquette and habits. Part one. The goal of bandsaw work is to be effective and efficient, to be smooth in your work, to be consistent with your cuts, and not to be wildly inconsistent or irregular. How can we accomplish this without getting injured? It is my belief that building a foundation of intelligent habits, building the correct habits, and trying to never deviate from these habits will yield the best results in terms of quality of work, safety, and longevity of career. So let's let's go over some habits. Now, every bandsaw operator will have their own spin on these habits and etiquette. Now, certainly the goal is to do repeatable, high quality work, but we can't work if we're injured. So first and foremost, let's talk safety, and we can work backwards from there, and then get into tips and advice for manipulating material more effectively to increase quality of output. So safety and foundational habits. Cultivate a manner of movement, a manner of posture around the bandsaw that make it impossible for you to cut yourself. By the way, this is my best advice when it comes to avoiding injury with any dangerous tools or machinery. Whether it be bandsaws, knives, a hatchet, an axe, a chainsaw, etc. Position yourself in such a way and use a certain posture so that when pressure is applied to the tool, all possible mistakes are taken into account. So if you're standing there and you're applying pressure to something you're cutting, whether it be with a knife, chainsaw, or bandsaw, if there was a slip, let's say in the case of a knife, if there was a slip, where would that knife go? In the case of a chainsaw, if there was a kickback, where would that chainsaw kickback go? What would be the direction, the path that that kickback would travel? And so before we do our cuts, before we, as we're setting up for our cuts, with all of these tools, we need to position our bodies in such a way that we would be out of the trajectory of any possible slip or any possible kickback or any possible et cetera, et cetera, mistake like such as that. When it comes to the bandsaw, I'll tell you about a technique called hand grounding or hand rooting, um, which will minimize any chance that you might push your own hand or your own fingers into the blade accidentally. Okay, bullet point number one. Build a habit to never reach across the cutting side of the bandsaw blade. Whether it's turned on or not, even when the bandsaw is off, don't reach across the area in front of the cutting side of the blade. At the very least, if there is material on the table platform you need to clear away, reposition your body and reach in such a way that your limbs never cross the cutting side of the saw blade. This is a habit that I've built into the way I move around a bandsaw. Whether the saw is on or off, I try to never really reach my arm on uh, across the cutting side of the blade. And I move in this way even when the saw is off so that the habit is very firmly ingrained in my move, set of movements that I do near the bandsaw. Good habits, good habits are critical because I got to tell you, there's going to be some days when you are sleepwalking through your day for various reasons. Habits are the, th- the thing. That you that you need you need to be you need to be able to just be on autopilot and have your habits be so um, precise and so safe that you will be safe. Okay, so yeah, it's better to if you're clearing material off the tabletop portion of the band side, it is better to always reach from the non-cutting side of the blade, from the back of the blade. And thereby, you can clean off whatever bones you've just cut, whatever stakes you've just cut, whatever debris is on the platform. You can clear that off safely. Okay, next bullet point. Always push your hands down, down into the tabletop platform when cutting material. This is called grounding or rooting your hands. You never want to push your hands toward the blade. Always use downward pressure instead. And as you root or ground your hand 
uh, into the actual tabletop of the blade. As you root down, you're wedging slightly inward towards the blade. You're, you're wedging your hands slightly inward. Root your hands, ground your hands down. Never have them floating in the air, or holding onto a bone up in the air. Always want to be grounded down onto the table. And then you're wedging the material in, in, in the direction of the saw. Next bullet point, use fists. Use fists rather than the open hand position when possible. And I would say as you get close, as your hands get closer and closer to the blade for certain cuts, for certain close cuts, that's when you want to have all your fingers tucked in and in, in your hands are in the shape of a fist more or less. And you can use the sides of your hands, the thumb side of your hands to, to wedge the material uh, close to the bandsaw and you're gr- grounded and you're rooted onto the tabletop and then you're wedging in, in, using fists. Keeping fingers tucked in helps you keep track of where your fingers are better than the open hand position. Next bullet point, keep a relatively clean and tidy tabletop platform. The more material such as stakes and roast and debris that is built up on the platform, the more material that is built up, there's likelihood that something will uh, uh, fall on the platform. That's my experience. The more cluttered my platform is, I tend to knock something off. And the problem there is, A, you don't want things falling on the floor, but actually the bigger problem is that, it, from my perspective, the bigger problem is if something falls or is beginning to fall, there is a strong tendency, a reflex, to reach for it that's built in. Uh, it's, a, it's like a, a built-in reaching re- reflex to catch something. And this, as someone who works with sharp tools, you have to uh, uh, you have to deconstruct all your reflexes. You have to overhaul them, and um, reflexive reaching is 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 a, is something you need to completely avoid, and you need to create a circumstance where you're not having to reflexively reach for anything. This is not ideal. When we reach suddenly and quickly, bad things can happen. So we never want to be moving quickly and reflexively, or especially or not, especially around a bandsaw. We want to do everything we can to minimize any spastic or unpredictable movements around the bandsaw. And keeping the tabletop platform relatively tidy is one of the things that we can do. So keep your tabletop relatively tidy, free from debris. Um, turn off the saw when you're not using it. This is a really good one. Um, there are times when um, you, it, it, in some circumstances, it makes sense to briefly walk away from your bandsaw just for a, a moment or a real quick moment. Uh, but you never want to walk away from a turned on bandsaw for any length of time. Uh, this is actually more a safety measure for coworker safety. Because when you're standing at the bandsaw, and the bandsaw is on, you are effectively blocking your coworkers from being able to hurt themselves on it. But if you walk away, a coworker walking past the bandsaw could accidentally trip near the saw and cut themselves in a various way, any number of various ways. So, whereas when we're standing at the bandsaw, we block this from happening mostly. Never want to leave the bandsaw on for more than a moment when you've walked away from it. Just turn it off. Next bullet point, keep conversations to a minimum or no talking while operating the bandsaw. My preference when I'm operating a bandsaw for any length of time is to put earplugs earplugs in and to go into, that helps me get into the right zone, the right frame of mind while I'm operating the bandsaw. Earplugs may be situationally appropriate for my workplace and maybe it's not appropriate for your workplace use your discretion my workplace has multiple loud machines droning away at any given moment so when we uh, so we have to shout or use gesture to communicate with each other anyway that's a normal part of our work experience uh, earplugs are fairly normal for people to wear fairly common and we also we all get to know how to get each other's attention if we really need to um, to communicate something important and by the way earplugs don't cut out all sound, we can still talk to each other while wearing earplugs. Um, we can hear everything people are saying. It just cuts down on the general loudness of the of the ambient noise. Um, what was I going to say about that? Um, and some, 
it's not that uh, you you sh- when when I say no conversation, no talking at the bandsaw. Um, what I mean is it, this isn't chatting time. I mean, I still will say things like "oh, this or that" or "this or that." People will say things to me, but it's shortened to the point. And then when I'm ready to get, when I need to get into more lengthy conversation, I just turn off the bandsaw and you know talk that way. Um, but when I'm at the bandsaw, conversation is very succinct and to the point. And then I'm concentrated back on my work. Okay, next bullet point. Never wear a chainmail cut glove while operating the bandsaw. Chainmail cut glove is extremely dangerous when uh, be, when at the bandsaw because they can be pulled. If they if you were to cut your hand, the blade would would pull the chainmail, and you don't want this. Uh, next bullet point. Put the blade guard the. Uh, the vertical blade guard higher or lower depending. And of course you move that vertical blade guard when the machine is turned off, not while it's on. Now, this is going to also be situationally different based on the type of shop that you are in. In shops where there's just a little bit of bandsaw cutting that happens fairly infrequently, I'll use that vertical blade guard a lot, move it all the way up or all the way down when the bandsaw is is not being in use, etc. At the shop I'm at now, we use the bandsaw basically all day long. It's running most of the time. So the blade guard is left up pretty much all day long. But this is something, this is a tool that can be used for general safety. Uh, Next bullet point, use the adjustable tabletop measurement guard when shining. So that would be the, the guard that measures and goes perpendicular to the saw blade. Uh, when doing, performing a chine on either, a, um, you know, uh, a rib roast or a, uh, uh, a chuck subprimal or a lamb rib rack or, you know, any sort of loin, uh, use the, use the guard set a couple inches out from the blade for, as a safety protocol. I had, uh, one of my coworkers, father's did cut himself while chining. Chining is um, one of the more dangerous things we do, that and sawing knuckle bones. I'll get into both of those in more detail later on. But both of those, um, you know, chining has a potential to pull the operator into the blade. So using the adjustable table measurement guard is one of the safety interventions we can use to minimize risk. Next bullet point, replace the saw blade when it gets dull. This is any cutting tool you're going to want to have a sharp blade on, bandsaw included. A sharp saw blade will cut easier, requiring less force to push the material through. Also, a dull blade while chining will pull the material more drastically into the blade. You don't want this. This can make chining more difficult and also more dangerous. Next bullet point, uh, having to do further, uh, another, uh, furthermore on saw blades, learn the proper tensioning for your particular bandsaw as you set up your saw blade, uh, your bandsaw in the morning, and you're tensioning that saw blade. Depending, the, depending on the make and model of your bandsaw, some saws allow, allow you to keep cranking the tension tighter and tighter. If you have one of these type of bandsaws, you want to really learn what is the proper tension for your particular bandsaw. Now, if the blade is tensioned too tight, it can snap while you're cutting with it. If you've ever had this happen, it is quite memorable of an experience. Um, Will definitely make you, you know, shake some shit out of your boot. It's that kind of thing where you it's fucking freaky. So uh, you don't want the saw blade to snap. So learn the proper tensioning for your particular bandsaw. All right, part two, or maybe we're at part three. I don't really know. Next section is going to be called basic concepts, techniques, and stances. Stances. How to stand at the bandsaw. Okay, so let's start out with balanced tensioning. First concept is balanced tensioning. As you move material, whether it be a steak or a roast or a bone, through the cutting blade, 
of the bandsaw. The goal is to create a balanced and even tensioning or pressure on each side of the object being cut. If balanced tensioning is not present, the blade can torque and uh, wobble and, and bend while cutting, and this is not ideal. Now, the operator can accomplish this balanced tensioning using several methods. These methods will differ dependent on which style of stance the operator chooses. Okay, so stance. There's the side saddle uh, stance, which is standing to the side of the bandsaw. We sometimes call this the spooning position. Um, and then there is the from behind position, which is in, in the the back of the bandsaw. Uh, we sometimes call this the doggy style position. Call it whatever you want. We got the side saddle. We got the doggy style. Now, side saddle. Hips are always in contact with the sliding table platform. The operator will use the hips to move material through the saw blade in the side saddle position. The hands are responsible for creating uh, a balanced tension on either side of the object being cut. And from the side saddle position, this balanced tension is accomplished by reaching the left hand around the back of the saw blade, the back non-cutting side of the saw blade. And the left hand uh, will help to pull the stake or roost or, or roast or whatever you're cutting. Help will help to finish pulling it through the blade, and this is known as the reach around. Often butchers will describe the reach around technique with a creepy sort of gleam in their eye. The cut. Uh, that's all I'll say about that. The cut may be initiated with the right hand grounded on the tabletop platform and tensioning the near side of object with the right hand while the far side of the object, let's say it's a loin chop you're cutting, is pressed to the adjustable measuring guard and the cut may be initiated in this way, with tension on both sides and on the far side the chop is uh, pressed, pressured to the cutting guard. The cut may be initiated in this way, but then the left hand reaches around to guide and keep tension on the far side of the steak or roast as you're pulling it through. You can see how difficult it is to talk about this stuff. It'd be much easier to show you. I'm going to see if I can do um, a video to show some of these techniques. All right. Now, if the operator is standing at the rear of the bandsaw, then the entire cut is made without the use of the adjustable measurement guard. The adjustable measurement guard is pushed all the way to the far side, away from the blade. And then the, the operator standing behind the bandsaw, which also, now that I'm thinking about it, and you could probably think of it as standing in front of the bandsaw, just to confuse you even more, you're standing at the, uh, the cutting side of the bandsaw and you're pushing the material through the blade with both hands on either side of the blade and you're creating a balanced tension on either side of the material being cut with what the right hand on the right side of the blade left hand length of the left side and you're you're balanced tensioning in that way as i mentioned in part one it's a good idea to tuck your fingers into fists when all possible, when at all possible, and it is essential to ground or root both hands with downward pressure into the tabletop platform, even while slightly wedging your hands towards each other, thereby creating balanced tension and a clean, straight cut. Now, I prefer another word on stances. I prefer the side saddle for certain things, such as cutting chops, cutting loins, Whereas I prefer the from behind position for cutting things such as bones or cross cut shanks or often roasts. I'll use that from behind position and I'll have uh, uh, one hand on each side of the blade creating balanced tension. So I use both positions. I've worked in shops where it was only possible to stand on one side of the saw. This has to do partly with the layout of your particular shop, whether you're able to use both positions or not. Part three, beginning, uh, beginner's advice for chining and close cuts. 
Beginner's Advice for Chining in Close Cuts, Part 3. Um, so, when you're a beginner, you need to put in a lot of time on the saw in order to develop skill and in order to just become comfortable with the tool. You need to put in a lot of time. So this is like phase one of of bandsaw operation is this beginner period of time. Now during this period of time of first exposure to bandsaw use, the main goal is to become comfortable, to avoid injury, and to not screw anything up too bad. Once you're through phase one and you know how to move around the machine properly and comfortably and safely, then you can start implementing more advanced techniques. But um, let's talk about chining for beginners. So you got a rib, a bone-in rib subprimal, let's say, and you want to get that chine bone off using the bandsaw. Um, One advanced beginner technique this is something i used when i was first cutting rib steaks from the bandsaw is that i would zip the bone i would zip the steak off uh, with the chine on it and then i would cut all my steaks i would cut through the whole uh rib subprimal that way i would have a stack of 13 steaks or however many i just cut off of it and then i would bring each steak back to the saw blade and chine them one at a time, chine bone off one at a time. Now this takes, this is much slower. This is a slow way of chining, but as a beginner, it can be useful just so you don't, uh, uh, hurt yourself as you're getting comfortable around the bandsaw. It accomplishes the same end result. And yet, um, It's certainly safer and uh, though slower. It's a good technique for beginners who who need to chine on a bandsaw but are not there yet as far as the horizontal chine, which is the more, you know, uh, quicker and more advanced way of chining. Now, uh, that advanced way of chining involves setting up your rib subprimal or your bone-in chuck subprimal um, and it involves setting it up in front of the, the cutting side of the saw blade and you have to tilt the subprimal on its corner and take off the whole chine in one motion. Um, now if you're in a position where you're starting to first practice this, uh, one tip I would give would with the, I would call this maybe the, call this the horizontal chine. Um, and one tip I would give would be to flatten one corner, the corner of that of the subprimal that is resting on the tabletop. I would z- maybe zip off just a few centimeters off that rounded corner and flatten that corner just slightly so that the rib subprimal is sitting on a flatter corner. And it sits a little bit less in a less rocking kind of a way. It sits a little bit more securely as you're beginning to do horizontal chines. Okay, next technique for beginners is the sandwich techniques for close cuts. So as a beginner, I would say don't get your fingers too close to the saw blade. You're just not used to it yet. You don't know how to uh, um, be close to a saw blade safely. So while you're getting comfortable and you're getting your techniques down, use the sandwich technique for close cuts. Um, The sandwich technique is when you use some other implement, such as a bone or another steak, to wedge or sandwich the close cut to the adjustable measurement guard. So on your side, your wedge, you've got it like, let's say, a, uh, a femur bone or another steak, and you're pressing on the stake and then on the far side you're pressing it to the adjustable measurement guard and you're sandwiching your cut in between these two things and then you're with your hips you're moving the sliding tabletop platform 
through the blade. Um, and this would be the sandwich technique, which accomplishes the same cut, and yet your fingers are further away from the saw blade while you're doing the cut. For beginners, I would recommend that. Now, what's an example of something, of a close cut? What is a close cut? It'd be like the final chop or steak that is being cut off of a loin, a loin, any sort of loin, pork loin, lamb loin, uh, uh, rib loin of some sort. You're cutting a whole bunch of steaks, and the first, you know, 11 or 12 steaks are easy because your hands are really far away from the blade. But as you get down to that last one or two cuts, now you're just within inches of the blade. And sometimes you might need to be within an inch or, you know, add an inch from the blade. Uh, That would be an example of a close cut. Um, So, like I said, cutting loins, you'll get into a close cut at the end. Uh, Marrow bones... Often you can be, you have to be really close to the blade if you're doing a canoe style marrow bone, which is a lengthwise cut on a marrow bone. This is a circumstance where you have to be really close to the blade. And uh, like I said, for beginners, I would say uh, use a sandwich technique, sandwich technique to avoid being close to the blade because you're just not ready for it yet. One further tip on canoe. Uh, while we're talking about a canoe style marrow bone lengthwise cutting would be to just slightly nip off one of the rounded sides so that your the your canoe your marrow bone is a little bit sitting more firmly and flatter on the tabletop so it doesn't rock as much as you when you were cutting lengthwise through through the uh, through the bone chining lamb rib racks is something where you have to do a close cut. It's very awkward if you're using a horizontal, if you're doing a horizontal chine method. Uh, one technique you can try is the standing vertical um, chining method, which is uh, it can be quite a bit safer than the horizontal chine. That's where you take your lamb rib rack, rib rack and you stand it on end, so it's. Um, uh, going up and down in the air, and you chine off that way. You could try that for lamb rib racks. Okay. Next section is going to be let me a word on sawing knuckle bones, which is another one of the very uh, dangerous portions of operating a bandsaw. Sawing beef knuckle bones. There, this is the end of the femur bones. This is the end of the humerus. These are the the kind of bulbous knotted ends of bones and as a bandsaw operator we have to sometimes saw them into small pieces and so how do you saw through one of these bulbous ends of the bones Um, it is very easy for the saw blade to catch awkwardly on these knuckle bones and cause the bone to jump and spin very dangerously and scarily if you is this is is something that really commonly freaks people out when they're trying to cut through these knuckle bones and it'll catch and jump and spin and get thrown in weird directions so i'm gonna do i'm gonna see if i can do a video about this but there's something called the relief cut method and then the half relief cut method and the x cut relief i made up all these names but i'm gonna see if i can um and demonstrate them in video at some point here so you guys get an idea what I'm talking about. But it involves taking your femur bone, for example, and what you do is you first, before you cut the middle portion of the bone, you take the, 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 the bulbous rounded end and you cut a few inches into that, maybe and sometimes even in the shape of an X into that, with the bone um, running canoe style pointed at the saw blade, but you're just cutting through the knuckle portion of it and you're cutting an X into it. And then you turn your whole bone horizontal. So now you're in a cross cut position across the marrow bone and then you can 
then nip off those the knuckle portion and it breaks into either two portions or four portions because you've done a relief cut on that knuckle already. And this is can be a really good way to cut your knuckle bones into small pieces safely. Next section, maybe we'll call this part four. General tips for being more effective in your work. So here's a handful of tips. Use spray water to decrease friction on the table platform. Do I do this all day long, especially with lamb. Um, pigs, I'll use this a lot. Um, it involves, we have a, a sink of water, a sink, a commercial food kitchen sink, whatever, nearby the bandsaw, and I'll use like this, uh, you know, I'll walk over there, I'll use the spray mechanism and sh- just spray a little water on the tabletop portion of the the cutting platform. I'll do that when and it what it does is it decreases friction and allows me to um allows cuts to zip through the bandsaw with less friction, less pushing. I have to, I can I have to don't have to put as much pressure to push it through the saw blade because it's not frictioning against the tabletop. It slides very easily across the tabletop, especially certain types of loins are really going to stick to the tabletop. And so that little bit of spray of water really helps. Okay, next one, number two, cluster your work when possible. I'm a big fan of clustering my work. So if I'm doing like, you know, six lamb in a row, they're all cut the same way and they're all for the same customer, then I'll pile up all six of those loins um, and I'll pre-trim them and I'll have them set aside. And then I, when it's time to do loins, I'll zip out all the loins at the same time. Or when I'm cutting shanks or something, I'll cut all my shanks at the same time together. That's called clustering your work. You can see some really great images of that in uh, Travis's American Butcher's um, Instagram account. He shows a lot of pictures of, uh, you know, at times he'll show pictures of a whole tabletop filled with pork loins or a whole tabletop filled with another type of cut. And that's the idea is that he's clustering similar work so that you can just cruise through a bunch of the same movements and then move on to a different set of movements and move on to a different set of movements when your work is clustered in that way. Tip number three. Sometimes it's necessary or it's useful to partially freeze a loin before zipping it through the bandsaw. Um, I, this occurs, this circumstance occurs with loins and shoulders very commonly. We need to cut either, a, a, let's say, a lamb loin into chops or when you need to cut a shoulder, a lamb shoulder into steaks and chops, arm chops and shoulder chops, etc. on the bandsaw. And you're working with a carcass quality, which is sloppy, um, um you know, not very much fat on it. This can happen or just the muscle consistency is weird and loose and sloppy. It's hard to cut effectively and cleanly on a bandsaw when carcass quality is poor. And in this case, if it's really sloppy and mushy, you can stick it in the freezer for a little bit and just get a partial freeze on it just to firm it up and then you can zip it through the bandsaw that way so this would be very common with lamb or goats or deer or elk although it's more commonly with deer or elk we're doing boneless back straps etc but every now and again when i was working uh while game processing you get someone that wants some bone in loin steaks and in this case if you're dealing with a a, a leaner or a sloppier lamb loin or um deer or elk loin, then you can just get a partial freeze on there uh, and then move them through the bandsaw because it'll be firmer and it'll cut cleaner after that. You'll get clean steaks that way. Uh, Number four, if cutting in a team scenario where the bandsaw operator is feeding a group of meat cutters that are standing adjacent to the saw at a cutting table, it's a good idea for the person or persons standing closest to the bandsaw operator to be responsible uh, to be responsible for some if not all 
of the removing of cut material from the bandsaw table platform as well as the pre-trimming and prepping of cut material that will be fed back to the bandsaw operator for further cutting. So pork loins, lamb loins, shoulders that are being prepped for steaks. What will happen is the bandsaw operator will will cut a whole bunch of subprimals from the carcass and sometimes those subprimals need pre-trimming and will need to be then further broken down on the bandsaw. So if you have a very clear delineation, clear delegation of responsibilities in a team cutting scenario, then the person standing right next to the bandsaw knows, okay, knows that they are responsible for clearing certain materials off the platform table and other subprimals they're responsible for grabbing them off the platform table pre-trimming them and then putting them back on the platform table so the bandsaw operator doesn't have to stop his cutting his or her cutting to trim things uh that's uh, uh a tip on a team cutting scenario that can make things go easier. So an example of pre-trimming is that with uh, lamb loins, for example, or pork loins, right? You're going to have a different uh, amount of fat on each of those. Some of them will have excessive fat, inches and inches of fat. Um, um, some t- and uh, there's things like the spinal cord will need to be taken out of lamb loins and such. And, um, Sometimes you're going to want a little bit of that shoulder blade bone to be taken out of your the cap area of the lamb loin. And um, so you're going to want some suet fat, some of the kidney fat to be peeled off. And all this stuff is in the category of pre-trimming that needs to be done before the lamb loins or the pork loins or whatever are cut into steaks. Um, so if someone is clearly responsible for doing that, they can pre-trim they can cut the fat down to the appropriate level across the whole loin etc etc hand it back to the bandsaw operator who can then zip out the steaks and the steaks are done and there's no pre-trimming that needs to happen after these steaks are done because you already got your fat levels down to the amount that you want last tip face cut for aesthetics and higher yield um Face cutting is when you just sort of square up the end of your loin so that you um, can get the most yield out of your uh, the stakes that you're cutting off of the loin. Okay, next section, general maintenance and longevity. So a lot of shops don't do this, but... It is for the for the longevity of your bandsaw. I would say clean it every day at the end of the day and take it fully apart and remove the band wheels, remove the saw blade, remove everything. Clean all these parts individually, and then every morning reassemble. Um, and when you're assembling the bandsaw, use a food grade spray on lubricant. Every, uh, and every morning as you're assembling and um, spray this lubricant on any area that might experience friction on your bandsaw. As the blade is moving, there are areas that that the bandsaw passes along and you want to have uh, a lubricant along all those areas to minimize friction for the longevity of and uh, successful maintenance of your bandsaw. For the serious production shop, it's a good idea to have two bandsaws, one utilized as a backup for when the primary saw is down for repairs, which will inevitably happen. At the very least, if you don't have two bandsaws, if you don't have a backup bandsaw, then certainly it's a good idea to have sp- spare parts. Spare parts are a good idea to save you from having to shut down all your production if the bandsaw stops working. Man, I remember hearing stories, especially in the small, you know, small butcher shop setting of saws that will only get cleaned once a week or longer, and just all sorts of the nasty debris that would collect in those saws, and just like maggots in the summertime and all sorts of stuff. Holy smokes, plenty of stories like that out there. Um, 
I would advocate for cleaning this saw every day. And, uh, man, there's some incredible bandsaw operators out there. It is such a cool thing to watch someone who's fucking dope at operating a bandsaw. Um, so, uh, my hat's off, and I'd love to hear that some of those guys have just been doing this for, you know, their whole careers. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Travis, again, that was great. A lot of information in there, a lot of useful information there. And you know what, Ryan? You're in luck. You got one of those guys who's been doing this for years and has done, you know, lots of cutting. That's me. I remember I used to break lambs on a bandsaw. We would do... Uh, one of my first jobs was running the bandsaw uh, during lamb day uh, at the packing slaughterhouse I used to work out in. We would do, you know, about 200 of them. And I would stand there and I'd, a tree of lambs would come in. It would be uh, 10 per t- tree, unless we were running out of trolleys. And we'd use S hooks and we'd get as many as we could. We'd take a lamb off, uh, knock off the back legs, or we, I mean I, and... Uh, then break it down entirely on the saw, and we would do this in about 40 seconds. Um, and we were just making uh, box up primals. We didn't do any chining, but, you know, we would split the legs, uh, leave the sirloin on, uh, split, uh, split the ribs, split the shoulders, knock the shanks off, the, the front shanks, leave the back shanks on uh, because we didn't know what the retail cutter would want to do. And we would uh, take the flaps off and then leave the saddle whole. I also did this on pig days. We would do about 150 pigs and I would, you know, they would be primaled on the block or on the rail. Then I would get all the subprimals and, uh, you know, chine them, cut them down. Then, you know, that was, that was pig day. We also, uh, about, I would say about 20% of our work, we would do all the way into fabricated cuts for, um, you know, like a true cut and wrap, but 80% of our business was to, uh, big, a big grocery chain that, uh, sells, um, like whole special foods, I guess you could say. And so some of the tips I learned is I, I never used the guard to chine. And what uh, Ryan was saying made made sense. But just the way we were doing and the amount of product we were pushing, economically, it didn't make sense. Or not economically, flow-wise, I think. Because safety is always important. And safety is always economic. But to just leave the... Um, guide all the way in the open position and then leave your blade guard um as low or as high as you needed it for the biggest thing you were going to cut you know when you're standing uh sideways on the saw or side saddle as i always called it you want that guard to be lower than your face and you know you always want to make sure it's there because if you lean or trip, you know, your face gets pretty close to that blade. And, but we wouldn't adjust the, the guard for chining because we say like a pork, we would, you know, run the middle through, cut off the belly, knock the loin off, then knock the center cut, then chine the rib. And we wouldn't, you know, go back and move that guard, we would, because this whole process would take like, you know, less than 30 seconds to do this. And you'd be spending, you know, my boss would always say in that industry that if the bandsaw wasn't running, we weren't making money. And it was always loud in that room. We had two bandsaws, a well saw, two 2500 vacuum sealer ultra vax. So it was a super loud room. And there was just a a rule you don't talk to the bandsaw operator with the ebbs and flows of you know doing large cutting like that we would also have a spray bottle full of water and usually it works best on pork and also lamb not so much on beef but when you start getting fat build up on your sled and you're pushing and you're uh 
your loin, let's say you're cutting chops, is getting uh, is dragging on your sled, you spray water on it and it's going to lubricate it. Now, if you are just beginning in this industry, I do not recommend that you do that. But some high end bandsaws or high volume bandsaws that um, are breaking saws, like four quarter saws, have built in water systems for it. So anyone who tells you that it, it you shouldn't do that, you know, industry designers and engineers have designed tools to have that implement. And essentially, that water is creating a plane so the primal could hydroplane as you move it. So where you have to then cut, drag back, cut, drag back, you go zoop, 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 zoop. And as far as Ryan talked about, he didn't want to mention brands, but I'll say that a high-speed bandsaw, especially one that is a pro cut, um, which I think used to be Torre, they merged, Um a pro cut high speed bandsaw, think 120. And the reason it's called 120 because that's the blade length. So, like a 116, that's that blade length. Usually, 120 is standard. The blade, or my, I have an old Biro, and they don't even make that blade size anymore. I have to get them special ordered. It's also a pain in the ass. So, uh, pro cut high speed 120 is. When I mean high speed, it could do like 300 feet a second or something stupid. It's fucking insane. And it's so fast that it cuts through the fabric of time. And I say that all the time. It cuts so fast that it doesn't even leave any bone dust. That's how fast this thing is. Not really. You may still have to do some scraping, but it is a very fast saw. And it is one of my favorite pieces of machinery I have ever had the pleasure of working with. Talking about the first thing that I or the first thing you do when you're setting up a bandsaw is you want to make sure it is turned off and unplugged. If it's hardwire, you want to make sure you have a lockout tagout procedure because a lot of the like the one I was just talking about, the Pro Cut has three safety magnet switches. But if you uh, where if the doors open, it won't run. If the uh, bone dust uh, catch is open it won't run if the sled's on improperly it won't run but many bandsaws or older bandsaws have no safety mechanisms like this that if if it's if the blade's on and it's plugged in you could turn it it'll it could cut you it could have the potential to cut you so you always want to make sure that you uh unplug it or lock it out during the setup process and during the cleaning process, unless you're one of those lazy uh, cleaners that just turns it on and then just hoses it while it's running. Don't be that guy. Do, do it properly. And then as far as blade storing, I just want to touch on that you want. So anything that's like cast iron or iron or untreated like blades or grinder parts or things that like are, are, stealer um store those parts in your cooler the cooler temperature is going to stop oxidization where if you were to store it in your processing room where your cleaners come in raise that temperature up to 70 degrees 80 degrees 90 degrees during the cleaning process because there's so much steam and humidity overnight your blade will oxidize and you'll end up with rust and sometimes the usda inspector will make you throw a a very new blade away because it doesn't look right. Um, and even lubricating it won't prevent it. So clean your blade, spray it with mineral oil, hang it in your carcass cooler. It Trust me, it will work. It will save you money in blades. And uh, then one last thing is if you're cutting flonkin, that's something I would always recommend is freezing. Um because you you want it to be you don't want it to be floppy it'll, it'll rip it apart and then uh just real quick uh, uh, i remember I, was, I went from working in a fast pace you know a couple hundred carcass a day packing house environment to working in a three carcass a week retail shop my first week there uh we broke a beef and they're like, oh, Travis, can you cut up the the bones? Uh, we have a customer that will buy all of our beef bones. They make their own stock, et cetera. And 
I walk over to the bandsaw. It was a whole beef's worth of bones. I turn it on and I start wiggling my hips, you know, side saddle and just thrusting bones through there. And I was done. And I look up, turn off, and everyone was um, looking at me because of how fast uh, I was doing it at a pace. And they perceived it as being reckless, but I was safe the entire time. So I don't know if this is a lesson in play to your audience, you know, or that people, I like to view this lesson as maybe they should be more comfortable around a bandsaw. These same people, or one of them, every time they turn it on and go, and start, they would do a little jump like, huh. And I just thought that was always funny because it was audible and I could hear it over the bandsaw that every time it started, they were like surprised that this machine was doing what it was designed to do. And just as I'm going through this thought, I remember specifically, they love the Holbart bandsaw. And a lot of people love Holbarts because it's very hard to slip a blade on a Holbart because they're grooved on both sides. Now, I don't like this because if you... If you put the blade on, you have the potential of dulling the teeth because it could create friction against the blade. And, but I understand because the only times I've slipped a blade off has been because it didn't have that groove wheel set in. And if you have a Hobart, look at it. It has a channel on either side with the blade rests. Most bandsaws don't have that. And it's, I don't know. I could take it either way. Um, I've broken many blades on band saws. I've broken many blades on splitting saws. It's not a testament of how uh, good I am as, uh, or bad I am or anything like that. It's just something that happens. And with the volume I've done, um, it'll happen. I, I And just freak things happen. It is loud. And it could startle you the first time. Um and it always happens when you don't expect it. It always happens when other people are around. And everyone looks at you and it's like, geez, this guy. Uh, I cut it. I cut at a guy's shop for the first time. And uh, I slipped the blade off because he had a old Torre. And it was just like, sweet. Everyone's looking at me. Now I have to take apart this bandsaw. And this was like two cuts in to an eight-hour shift. Anyway. I'm Travis Stockstill. This has been the Meat Block Podcast. I want to say a big thanks to Ryan O'Hearn. This was really his episode. And uh, if you want to support the show, please like and subscribe. Please leave a five-star review. Please tell a friend. Use the hashtag, the Meat Block Podcast. Follow us on social media. Just type in the Meat Block um, Podcast and you'll you'll find us. Follow Ryan at Gather and Break. Follow me at American Butcher fellow david even though he's not here at a farm butcher and if you want to support butchery in general please support the usa butcher team please buy everything that we mentioned from davidson's butcher supply and until next time keep your knives sharp and live in the margin